sponsored by McCams, getting you back on two wheels when it wasn't your fault. Yes, yes, there are lots of downsides to being on lockdown. While the sun beats the chemtrails out of the sky outside, you're trapped indoors and can't ride. The upside, however, is that you don't need to look at my ugly mug in any of this review, as I'm not allowed out to play with the Bike World crew. We'll get back to our normal style, if you can call it that, when COVID-19 has released its grip on the world. Until then, here is a flag-to-flag -flag review of the Triumph Thruxton RS in voiceover. Let's not sugarcoat it. Triumph has written the book on cafe racers. Sure, there have been paragraphs from other manufacturers, but in today's cutthroat, commercially driven landscape, where only the strong survive, the cafe racer sector belongs to Triumph. In 2016, when they updated the Thruxton, it made the transition from an underpowered heavyweight harking back to the days when men used to pay their way in pounds and shillings, and it went contactless, uh, in a good way. Here is a short extract from my 2016 Triumph Thruxton R review. A 1200cc traction controlled squeezy kneesy flying sex machine. On paper it sounds like Triumph has finally built the large capacity Daytona we've been waiting for. Show a big piston forks, Olin shocks, radial mount Brembo brakes, traction control, multiple riding modes, ABS and sticky Pirelli tyres are just some of the highlights. If you read the specs and then close your eyes, this thing is only a bright green wristband and a condescending safety brief away from the fast group at a Brands Hatch track day. Casting an eye over the R shows that there's so much more to this bike than the sum of its swanky parts. It is simply beautiful. Four years later, the Thruxton is still a beautiful base machine. On a personal level, the only bike I've possibly wanted more is the Speed Twin. On the side stand, it's a prettier bike for me, and in practical terms, I think the wide bars and flat seat would suit my life better. In out and out performance terms though, the Thruxton pips it. Much to the amazement of a fair few that have seen my Speed Twin review, I couldn't fall in love with it. It wasn't that I didn't like the good bits enough, more that the one bad bit let the rest of the show down so much so that in my humble opinion, there were better bikes to choose from in the sector. The forks just couldn't match the rest of the bike. Were they bolted into a lesser machine? I wouldn't have minded, but the rest of that bike is so good, so good. So this Thruxton RS, it is a beauty. All good rides start and finish with the tyres and Triumph's decision to go with the Metzler Racetech RRK3 is inspired. That tyre has always had my back and seeing them on this bike gave me an indication of the intent the RS has. They warm up like a teaspoon in a microwave and stick like butter to bread. In braking terms, the Brembo M50s tell their own story as well. The last word in braking performance and desirability is only when you push that last part of a panic squeeze that the ABS squeaks into life and you're reminded that there's a limit. Up to that point, your slowing and stopping is in very, very capable hands. A combination of piggyback Olins at the rear and big piston shower forks at the front looks great and feels even better. I know this review isn't about the Speed Twin, but this is the front end I think that bike needed. I love the juxtaposition of the vintage looking polished top yoke and the gold race ready forks. The 1200cc parallel twin is in the Euro 5 Club. It's also been worked on extensively. High compression pistons, reworked cams, a gas flowed head, they all feature. If you're a previous model Thruxton R owner, Triumph has basically done all of the things that you would have wanted to do to your motor. While there's no torque gain, it is delivered slightly lower down the rev range, and the whole rev range itself has grown by 500 very usable RPMs. Along with power going up, weight has come down. A lighter battery, case covers are thinner, including magnesium for the cam cover. They all contribute to a total weight loss of six kilos over the R. 
This RS weighs 197 kilos dry. Consider that there's 14 and a half liters of fuel to add to that weight if you go for a full tank, and you can expect a return of around 60 miles to the gallon. That's a Triumph figure, by the way. I can't give you a realistic, real world figure based on the kind of riding that we were doing. It just wouldn't be fair to the bike. Speaking of riding, the Thruxton RS absolutely fucking flies. It has that same narrow gauge feeling as the old bike, but there's something more about this one. I think I felt more confident sooner on the RS than I did on the R. Ah yes, by now, you may have realized I'm wearing double denim on this one. It's a bold look, but I think I managed to work it pretty well. To top it off, I strapped on some plastic knee sliders over my jeans. They call this the Canadian Tuxedo. Plus I like David Hasselhoff, and I can't take it back, it's done now. Anyway, it's a good job confidence was riding high, as TT race winner Gaz Johnson was our guide rider for the day, and it would appear he was having some kind of retro TT racer style flashback. My strap on sliders justified their space in my kit bag, and if there was a prize for riding too fast while wearing double denim, I would have won it that day. The RS is so easy to place. The chassis is more than capable of dealing with all the power and torque available, so there's never really a feeling that you're pushing things out of shape. Those extra revs available showed their value and we got stuck into some fast road miles in style. Genuinely, no complaints in riding terms from this rider. With the traction control turned off, you can honk a cat dealie or two, or three, or four. Everything this bike does feels easier to do than it did on the R. The whole time I love doing it while looking down at the clocks and that top yoke. It looks cool, especially when you know you're capable of getting a lick on if you want. It might not look it, but I was also comfortable all day. I'd have no worries at all recommending this bike if you have kind of big mileage plans on your horizon. There would, however, be murders in my house due to the lack of pillion arrangement. That's my only gripe with this bike. Looks wise, like I always say, that bit's up to you. For me, it's perfect. I rode the black one and loved it because I was too busy riding it to really care what colour it was. But when we were all parked up for coffee and clever talk, it was the two-tone one that grabbed my eye every single time. This Triumph Fluxton RS starts at £13,000. There are all kinds of bikes that you could buy for this money, and to consider this as a second bike based on its appeal would be rich. Like you'd have to be to own one as a second bike. Could you ride it as your number one everyday bike? Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to. In physical terms, you're not making that big a step away from sports bikes. If you go for one of these though, just remember it won't be that risk-taking cramp fest like sports bikes usually can be. It is a very, very cool bike. Right now my 40-year-old bones would really struggle to choose a £13,000 1000cc sports bike over one of these. Not least because of the obvious running costs when it comes to insurance and all of that other grown-up guff. When you decide to put style ahead of speed on your must-have list, it's bikes like this Triumph Thruxton RS that deserve your attention. Caring about how a bike looks doesn't make you gay or straight or slow or any less of a biker than you were when you had that old R1. I'd also bet my last quid that every single bike you've ever owned, how it looks, even down to the colour it is, has formed part of your decision-making process. I don't want to sound like your dad, but if your mates are still telling you the opposite and you're struggling to come to terms with that, you've got the right idea probably just got the wrong mates. Mm -hmm.